Hi guys, welcome to today's tutorial. Today we're going to cover some level 3 chemistry uh, looking at the spectroscopy internal. So um, normally most schools do this internal towards term 3 because you need to have done organic to do spectroscopy. Um, so hopefully this is not too late because I only have um, you know plenty of time to record during the holiday. So let's get into it. So the, the spectroscopy internal is actually quite straightforward. Um, yes, it is an internal standard and different schools do it differently, but then the skills is the same. Like you have to be able to look at the, th look at the three types of um, spectrum and analyze it and determine what molecule that you have like these spectra belong to okay so this is actually um, if you look at all the all the high school chemistry um, spectroscopy is surprisingly useful at university if you decided to do more chemistry later on because you will need to um, after, after after every single organic lab like you know then you're like oh I made this particular molecule or this particular organic compound and then how do we know that? Well, we can put it in these different types of machines and then they print out like a little spectrum, just like you watch, you see on TVs, you know, CSI and all that sort of stuff. And then you can use the thing that you've learned in class to actually, you know, make the conclusion that you have made what you claim to make. Okay, so let's get into it. So the, this particular video is only looking at the, th the three techniques. So I just want to uh, look at the three different types of spectrum. Um, we don't do 1H NMR, which is I think, which I personally think is very very useful. But we don't do 1H NMR in NCEA. So if you, you know, from, um, but if you do Cambridge, you probably still find the other three quite helpful. But 1H NMR we don't do. Okay. So one key thing with the with the three types of spectrum um, is that you I often say this you can you only you can only obtain certain amount of information from each technique. Um, like say for example I say this to my year 13s every year like say um, if you um, heard some gossip you know heard some tea and then you want to find the whole story like say the infrared is like the Instagram the the NMI is like the snapchat and the mass spectrum is like the TikTok like so but you have to look at all three to get the whole idea to actually understand what's going on okay so the each each spectrum on this on the own is very very um, well, in, if you want to determine what type of molecule it is, it's not very helpful. You cannot do that by just simply looking at one particular spectrum. You have to look at all three. But to do well in this particular uh, achievement standard, you have to be able to identify the certain features from each technique and then make the conclusion of what type of molecule it is. Okay, but um, this video is only about determine like just going through what you're going to see on each spectrum and the next video we are going to look at some specific questions and how you just going through like my mindset of how of, uh, how i approach a um like a spectroscopy question for internal okay so let's get into it so the first one i tend to start with is infrared spectroscopy um infrared is by far the easiest one and it's by far the most um I wouldn't, I wouldn't say useless, but it's not. It's the least informative one in terms of the, what sort of information you can get from it. Because um, the only thing that you can get are these. You can only look for OH and NH bond, which is between 3000 to 3500 wave number or per centimeter. Um, and then which is CO sing, uh, double bond, the carbonyl group, which is between 1600 and 1800 wave number. So what that means is that you can't look for anything else. I mean, if you if uh, depends on what school you go to, but on the resource sheet that you get provided, sometimes you get a massive table. Um, they will say, oh, you might be able to see a CCL at 500 wave number. I mean, any sane chemist probably wouldn't look at that because anything below 1500 is what we call a the fingerprint reason, uh, region. I mean, you wouldn't want to look at your fingerprints and trying to figure out, you know, what what's going on in there. There's just too much information. So the only two things that you know, because we at, at our school, and I think that's a thing across um, all New Zealand as well, you need to show two pieces of evidence um, from each spectrum. Okay, so this will give you two. You can, and one thing that people always look, um, always forget is that what you see on the spectrum is important. What you don't see on the spectrum is also important. So the presence or the absence of certain peaks are equally informative. 
okay so we need to take that into account so for example what that looks like um so a spectrum is kind of like this i got some examples underneath oh god it's a very very straight line as you can see uh, there we go um so this is wave number so what it means um with the ch bond like I, you probably notice i don't even put the ch bond here because every single organic molecule has ch bond and ch bond look like this you just have a sharp peak at 3000 right on 3000 okay um that's why i really don't like the 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 range of 3000 to 3000 uh 3000 to 3500 for the um an h and oh because a lot of people just look at the three that the peak on 3000 go or is that ch or is that nh or is that oh but just remember any sharp peak around 3000 is ch and you can just ignore that every single molecule have that and then 1600 like say around 1700 six, between 1600 and 1800 you may have another sharp peak and that's your c the one or and what does a um what does an oh and uh oops what does an oh and oh and uh, look like so this depends on what you have now normally people say if you see a sharp peak is nh if you see a broad peak is oh i mean i've seen sharp ohs i've seen broad nhs so it's really just a guideline you don't have to follow that to be honest and to determine let's say if you see something like this like that, and that and then like that and this is your ch and this is could be an oh it could be an nh okay and then a lot of people ask me how do you know if something is considered peak normally i go by the 50 mark if it goes by over 50 i say it's a peak if it doesn't go over 50 it's not a peak okay so let's go through some questions all right so this is the first one now this is a really good so again anything that you look for is on here so can you guys see this is between 1600 and 1800 so that means this is a c double arm uh, i have a carbonyl group tick now can you now this is when you have the oh slash nh peak combined they overlap with the ch bond so that means i have the oh or nh and you go how do i know if it's oh or nh and this is where you need to use other spectrum um, the other techniques to figure out what it is okay and then you may go what about all this uh, i don't really care about them okay you only look for two things so your ir should literally take about 10 seconds for you to just quickly look at that does it have carbon group yep and does it have oh and h yep oh nope oh sweet that's it but what you do need to do is that you need to like especially people from my school we need two bullet points from each spectrum so you need to tell me there is a peak um there is a peak between um 1600 to 1800 with all the numbers are given to you but you need to actually tell us there's a peak between which means meaning there is a uh, or indicating or proving there is a c double bond okay and you can see there's a broad peak um peak between 3000 um 3000 to 3500 wave number which is um which means it's an oh and h and this is where you go you know can i write down the options well i personally prefer you to put the correct um bond in um because what you could do with the spectroscopy equation just figure out the answer first and work backwards okay but we'll do that in the next video all right this one again this is a c the one o yes and this is your nh most likely nh is quite sharp and oh and this is your ch which i don't really care about next one um so this again this has a c dog on r and this is just a ch because it's right on 3000 can you guys see it's right on 3000 so it's not anything else don't look at this and go oh is this an nh or oh that's nothing that's that's what i mean 50 percent you know this is the threshold give or take um if it, if it was like this then i'll say that's a peak but it's not so okay so it doesn't have so you can say this has co yes this has no oh or nh and this is like just solving like a crime like you get putting all the puzzles together and then you're using all the clues to figure out you know who the who the bad guys all right i think this is the last one very easy um so this is just a ch again not really interesting there's nothing here there's nothing here so and this is 1500 so that means there's nothing here so there's no oh and nh there's no c double bond off okay so again what you see on the spectrum is important equally as important as what you don't see if they're not there that's also very very helpful okay so that's your ir very straightforward now 
NMR, certainty NMR. So this is to do with the nuclear magnetic resonance of carbons. Now, we are specifically looking at carbons for this particular um, for this particular section. Okay, so what the, in, in my introduction where I talked about 1H NMR, the H is to do with the hydrogen environment, but um, it's a little bit complex, but when we just deal with the carbon environments, okay? And then we determine the type of part the type of bond that carbon atoms are involved in, okay? Not anything else, carbon atoms. Now, this is something that um, may help you a little bit. The more electronegative elements or groups of elements that carbon is bonded to, the more de-shielded they are, the more chemical shift the peak has. So if you look at this chemical shift, um, these are the numbers. So you can, you don't really need to, you probably notice I haven't gone through how each of the machines work because you can just look it up on on YouTube because it's, it's really not what you're here for. You're just trying to hear, you know, being pragmatic and trying to solve the questions. So the, what, the reason why I put it in is for example, if I give you an example like this, CH3, CH2, CH2, CO, O H. Okay, so this particular carbon is bonded to a very electronegative oxygen, electronegative oxygen. So that means this is very electropositive. Well, in comparison, okay. So what that means is bonded to a very electronegative oxygen or groups of atoms. You know, with the oxygens and OHs. So that means it's really de-shielded. You can kind of think of it as as the electrons are uh, its shield, and then because it's bonding to a really electronegative element. It's taking the electrons away, so it doesn't have the shield anymore, which means it's more vulnerable in a magnetic, um, in a magnetic field. So it spins more. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. So in comparison, so for this particular one, this will this will have the highest chemical shift. This will have the second highest. This will have the third highest. This will be the fourth highest because the further they are, before the further the carbons are away from the carbon that's most electronegative, the less de-shielded they are because they're further away. It's kind of, you can think of like a bomb blast radius, like the people standing on the outskirt, you know, won't be affected as much, but then these poor souls sitting right next to it is gonna be affected, okay? So you can think of it that way. And then these are some tables. Um, again, we provide you all the tables. Um, so the chemical shift, you just have to look at the, on the spectrum. And look what um, and look at the carbon environment. So I've highlighted all the carbons. And I kind of gave up on the, because there's no point. It's pretty obvious. It's the carbons. Um, there are some really interesting ones, and and you will notice some of them overlap. Like say this 15 to 30, 0 to 15, 20 to 35, 30 to 60, 50 to 70. They all over, some of them overlap. Like say for example, if you see a peak, like say at 25, and you go, what is that? Is that a CH3 or is that a CH2? We normally aren't too fussy about that. I mean, it'd be great if you can identify them, but normally we just want to, again, two evidence from each spectrum, and there are plenty of things that you can identify from here. Okay, um, so, and then the carbon environments, the, the type, the number of carbon environments, that's something that I would like to go through um, using specific examples. So here are some specific examples. So we're gonna draw these first. So the following spectra are from the following compounds. We've got 3 chlor 2 2 dimethyl propane one o hex one in hex 3 in propane amide. And people go, do I need to draw guys suck organics? Do I have to draw? Well, not necessarily, but and this is why you kind of need to you need to hopefully have realized that all of the chemical standards are kind of joining up together because they overlap more and more, and that's how it should be, because you can't really do chemistry just by chunks they kind of interlink and the more chem you do the bit the more you're going to find out that okay so at least if you're not really good at with reactions that's okay at least try to draw things okay so propyl 1 0 which is um let's just uh, draw propyl 1 0 first so here's an organic list as well just start with the c's propyl 1 0 let's just put the oh here uh, three chloro, so that means this is one, two, three, three chloro, put the C out here, two, two dimethyl, that means there's a C here, this is here, and then just complete the hydrogens, okay? Make sure every carbon has four, three bond, uh, four bonds. Hex one in, hex one in is us. Hex three in is us. I'm, I'm a bit lazy, I'm not doing the hydrogens. Propanamide is thus. Okay, so you have to know the functional groups. Okay, so first thing first, how many carbon environments do they have? So what is a carbon environment? Carbon environment is if they are 
um, if we go back to the to the de-shielding part, if you think about if the carbons are in the same type of environment, they will be de-shielded by the same amount. That means they will spin around the same way like each other. And that means the machine will pick them up as one particular peak, as one particular signal. Okay, so if you look at this, um, can you guys see, like say this, if you look at this carbon, I'm gonna rub out the numbers, um, if you look at this carbon right here, this carbon is bonded to two H's and Cl, which is really unique. No other carbon is bonded to a Cl. So this is a unique carbon, carbon group number one. And look at this carbon. This is very unique because you, this carbon is bonding to CH3, CH3, CH2, CH2. No other carbon is bonding to that. So that's quite unique. This CH2 here, that carbon is very unique because it's bonding to an OH, which no other carbon is bonding to. Therefore, it's carbon environment number three. And then if you look at these two carbons, this is a four, this is a four. Why are they four? Because you can look at it this way. Can you guys see this symmetrical in a way? That this CH3 is bonding to this blob. This CH3 is bonding to this blob. And if you, so I can draw the CR on this side and I can draw the OH on this side and you can see they are actually the same thing. Uh, okay, so it's symmetrical. And one really easy way to identify, identify symmetry is whenever you see some things like this, let's say, this is like a little person, I like say, for example, like that. This carbon and this carbon, they are symmetrical, okay? Because if I do the line like this, symmetry, this and this will have one, the same environment, this is different, this is different. And I, actually, uh, let me do the carbons here. Um, one thing that I really don't want people to get confused to is they, they just look at what they are bonded to directly. Like they go, uh, if you look at this one, they go, oh, this is a CH2, this is a CH2, so they are the same. No, they're not the same. You have to look at what they're bonding to in the entirety of the molecule. Because if you look at this CH2, this CH2 is bonding to CH, CH2. This CH2, this carbon is bonding to a CH2, CH, CH2, which is different because this carbon is bonding to that, this carbon is bonding to that. So they are obviously different, okay? So you have to make sure that you can identify that, all right? So going back to where we were, so why do we do this? So if we got one, two, three, four unique carbon environments, you will see four peaks. Does that mean you have four carbons? No, it means you have four peaks, okay? So there, there are at least four carbons. Um, and how many carbons there are? That's where we use the mass spectrum to figure that out. All right, let's do this one. This is one, two, three, four, five, six. All the carbons are unique. They're different to each other. And one way you can do, just grab a highlighter. If you want to pause, just look at the, just pause and go, all right, are there symmetry? Is there any symmetry around? And then are they bonding to different things? Which there are, so this is six peaks. And then if you look at this particular hex three, you can guys see this is symmetry here. This carbon is bonding to this CH2, CH3. This carbon is also bonding to CH2, CH3, which is also bonding to the right-hand side, the left-hand side, which are the same. So this is the same. So these two are the same carbon environment. These two are the same carbon environments. These two are the carbon environments. So this is three peaks, okay? And propane amide, so this is one, two, three, three peaks. Put the H's in when you draw them, but I'm just a bit lazy, okay? Okay, so bear that in mind, if we can come down to this particular um, structure. So these four, um, these four spectra are for these four molecules. So straight away, six peaks, this one. Okay. And if you want to identify what they are, you can. Can you guys see this is CH2CH? Can you, um, there's a double bond here. And then if you look at this table down here, down the right hand side, you can see between 100 and 150, you will see a carbon double bond. So this is one of the carbons in the double bond. And this is one of the carbons in the double bond because you have two carbons in the double bond. And if they are asymmetrical, you're gonna see each of them once on the spectrum. And, and you go, do I need to deter determine which one it is? I mean, it'll be great if you can, like by looking at this, um, this carbon right here will be more deshielded. Why? Because it's bonding to a lot of other things on the right and then the CH2 on the left. And this carbon is less deshielded, uh, is, is less deshielded compared to that because it has two H's and then, you know, the rest is the same as the other carbon. So it's not really that important, but as long as you can tell us, you know, on the spectrum, I see this, 
this as as my two two as my carbon carbon double bond, and there are six peaks, which means six carbon environments. You don't need to tell us which these are. All right, don't spend twenty minutes and go, oh my god, which ones which which ones? How do I panic panic panic? You know, and trying to look at these numbers. Oh my god, this is a twenty. 20, what is it? 21. Which one's the 21? It could be this, could be this. All right, which one is it? Don't worry about it. It's not essential because you have already determined which molecule this belongs to. All right, so let's do the next one. Um, and this is pretty obvious because this is four peaks. Because if it's four peaks, then it goes back to this one here, four peaks. Okay, and we can actually have a look at this one because this is bonding to CCL. And this is bonding to COH. All right. Actually, let me redraw the structure because this is where you can use the, um, the the table to actually determine what you got. And it's actually really important as well. When you have, like, say, if you have this carbon bonding to two H's, if you look at the if you look at the table, you may go, ah, oh, it says CH two, so it should be between twenty to thirty five. But then you also have this carbon bonding to the oxygen. And then if you see that, the CO, which is 50 to 70. Now, each carbon only shows up on the spectrum once. And they only show up with the most amount of chemical shift. So in this case, this will be between 50 to 70. And same with the CCL, which is right here. See, when you have a carbon bonding to CL, which is this guy here, which is between 30 and 60. So 50 to 70, which is clearly this one. So this one is for, let's number them. This is carbon number one, two, three, four, four. This is carbon number one. This is carbon number three. And then um, this one on, the, on this one is be carbon number four. And then this guy in the middle is carbon number two. Okay, and you may go, well, this carb, how do you know it's carbon number two? It's 40, like it's almost 40. There's nothing here on 40. Could it be CN, CBR? It's normal because you remember the table is just a guideline, just a range. And that's why I don't want you guys, whoever's listening, I don't want you to spend ages trying to identify each of the peaks. As long as you go, you yeah, four peaks, really sweet, that's great. I can see, I can see this a CCL peak, uh, sorry, the CO peak right here, great. Um, I can see the CCL, great, that's already enough information. Okay, so you don't need to worry too much about that. All right, let's figure out these two. Um, so when you see 180, 180 means 180, anything above 160 is a carbon carbon group. So this is a C or double one. And you can see this is 130, 130, let's go on the table, 130 is within this range. So this is a carbon carbon double bond. So that means when you have a carbon, so this is this one right there, this particular alkene is this one. Now, when you have symmetrical alkenes, they only show up once. This, even though you have two carbons in the double bond, but because they are the same environment, they only show up once. Okay, so that's the carbon environments, and I hope that's helpful enough. Let's just do a little bit more. So let's have a look at some examples. So this is um, what can I get from the spectrum? If it says solvent, don't look at it. That doesn't count. So you got two peaks. So what does that mean? That means you got two carbon environments. Carbon environments, not two carbons. All right, get that idea out of your head. It's two carbon environments, and this is 180. So that's C double one. This is 20. I don't really care because I already have two bits of information. I have this. I have this. Next, go next. All right, this one here. This is one, two, three, four, five, five peaks, which means five carbon environments. This is 170, which is a carbonyl group, and this is 70. 70 could be well by the most. Um, the most likely case, this is most likely carbon bonding to a, a oxygen. But like I said, I have seen plenty of chlorines or bromines at 70, even though it says 60 on the table. Okay, so just again, remember, if you're not sure, don't make any conclusions until you have looked at all three spectra. Okay, now this one, this is again C double O bond, and this is one, two, three, three peaks. And this one, this is four peaks. And this is this is this is one at 60 parts per million, which I really don't know which one does, could because it could be any of these. And this one at 35, so it could be actually any one of those as well. Okay, so one is when you have um 
when you can't make an informative decision based just you like, again just this, this just demonstrates that you can't decide on what it is by just simply looking at one spectrum okay but hopefully that's okay oh and I just want to point out one thing when you see a carboxylic acid you may have you go C bonding to the double bond or you have C bonding to the single bond or and this is where you need to remember you always go with the highest um, with the most significant chemical shift you're not going to see so the, if this carbon is already being displayed let's say if it goes over here over here so that's your carbonyl group you're not going to see this carbon anymore so maybe grab a pencil and just cross it out because sometimes people go oh this C double bond oh yep it's from this carbon oh there's a C single bond oh oh sweet that means this 60 is this carbon and then that's all wrong because you're giving two peaks you're assigning two peaks to one particular carbon don't do that okay um, and then this last one I just want to mention before I do the mass spectrum is this carbon over here when you have the just look at the table when you have the carbon bonding to a CCO to a carbonyl group I say this one this is going to be between 30 to 60 because the carbonyl group is quite electronegative okay next one mass spectrometry so mass, mass spectrometry is to do with um, heating um, so think of a if you're writing with a pen or if you see any like if you see a ruler any you always see a piece of paper around you anything like that just imagine the object that you're seeing is being put under enormous amount of heat and then that particular object is being chopped down into smaller pieces and all of these smaller pieces which we call fragments are going to show up on the max spectrum okay so but the most important one we don't really look care too much about that we care about the molecular ion so what's a molecular ion again so this is looking at the first ionization energy what is first ionization energy again first ionization energy is the amount of energy required to remove one electron from one mole of gaseous atom at um, you know to remove one electron and this is first ionization energy but if you look at that this m this is a molar mass and if you look at this m plus the molar mass is actually the same molar mass is the same why is that because you lost one electron and electrons are too small we say it doesn't have a mass but so you, you, you if you can identify what we call the molecular ion which is the furthest right hand side ion that you can see you know the molar mass okay and then once you know the molar mass you can determine if there's any nitrogen by using the nitrogen rule which is right here the nitrogen rule states if there's an odd number of nitrogen oops if there's an odd number of nitrogen there is an odd number of nitrogen uh, sorry odd number of molar mass there's an odd number of nitrogen if there's an even number of a molar mass there could be zero or even number of nitrogen all right just remember that and the last bit is looking at isotope peaks to look at cl br and iodine normally just cl and br we don't really care too much about iodine okay so let's look at some um just to give you some because the best way to teach us is just to give you some examples if you look at this the unit for the molecular for the for the mass spectrum is mz um, mass to iron ratio just m slash z i actually have someone that couldn't determine which type of spectrum it was because he couldn't understand the units okay just remember ppm is chemical shifts um, and mz is mass m even has a mass in it okay now you may some your teachers may go this is your base peak you know the hundred percent absorption or intensity you know very important actually no we not well i'm not going to focus on fragments because fragmentation is horrible um it's actually really difficult to identify and most of the time it doesn't even work that well so i don't even look at the base peak what are you looking for is us you're always looking for the furthest right hand side the furthest right peak okay you're looking for the furthest right peak because this tells you the molecular this is what we call the molecular ion Oops. this is the molecular ion peak because if you know the molecular ion peak you know the molar mass if you know the molar mass you know how heavy it is then you can use the nitrogen rule and that's really really useful okay so this means this molar mass is 60 mz so that means the molar mass is 60 grams per mole which means you may have zero or two probably never going to be more than two nitrogens in this particular case most likely zero okay so that's quite helpful and how's that helpful you may ask remember for the ir you know you have to make the tough decision is this oh or nh 
how do I decide? Well, if you are getting this 60 grams per mole, which is strongly hinting the most likely getting no nitrogen because the molar mass is quite small, it's most likely the OH from the IR. Okay, so that's how you use the three spectra together. Okay, and now the other thing that I do want to really that I do want to go through is this one. All right, so this is the biggie. So now you know how useful the molecular iron is. You're gonna have problems with this two peaks. Okay, and I have had numerous people every single year. It doesn't matter whose class it is. And people go, "Oh, so you amazing teacher, blah blah." Then I still have people that make up make the stupid mistakes every single year in the cohort to someone that do this. So please don't let that be you, okay? Now, how do we do the molecular? We look to the furthest right. We look at the highest one, yeah? So it's high, so it's, then you have a peak here, which is pretty obvious. But then you can see this tiny little peak over here. Can you guys see this is 73 and this is 74? But that 74 is a very, very small peak. It's very tiny. So it is one unit to the right of this really tall one, which is over here. So this, and why is that? Because we have isotopes. What are isotopes? You have carbon-13 and carbon-12. Carbon-13 isotopes exist, for, well, I can't remember that percentage, what, 0.01% of the natural exist, existing um, carbons. And carbon dating is extremely useful to date how old something is because they decay. Um, they lose the one extra neutron to become carbon-12 and then carbon dating is actually quite useful in that regard but in in this mass spectroscopy um, perspective you got carbon-13 and carbon-12 so it could be one of the carbons in the molecule is a carbon-13 which means it make the actual molecule weigh one more grams per mole than what it normally should be so in this particular instance, when you have a really tall one and the tiny one, which is again, I'll emphasize one unit to the right. Okay, one unit to the right and it's really, really small. This is because this is due to the carbon-13 isotope and we use the one on the left hand side as our molecular ion peak. This is what we call the M plus plus one peak. So we ignore this one. And if you get the molar mass wrong, your whole question is wrong. And I can show you why that is. Because if you identify the 74 as your molar mass, as your molecular ion peak, can you guys see your molar mass is going to be, going to be 74 grams per mole? 74 grams per mole, that means you are going to have an even number of nitrogen or no nitrogens. But the reality is, the molecular ion is 73 grams per mole, which is an odd number. That means you are guaranteed to have a nitrogen. Okay, so that the implication is so big that I, I'm wanting to spend a bit more time on this particular section because if you get this wrong, your whole thing's wrong. Okay, it's as simple as that. And don't always look to the furthest right. You look at the tallest peak and you look um, you look for the um, probably need for a little more space and then you look to see if it has any more peaks like say for example this is irrelevant to this graph okay so if you have like one here this is 101 for example then you have like a tiny one here would no, make that smaller you have like a tiny one here which is 104 and people don't be like oh my god you told me you know ignore the really short one on the right hand side this is not one unit away this is not due to the carbon 13 this is if there's nothing on the right hand side this is the molecular ion. Okay, it has to be one unit to the right. If it's like, if it's 101 here, and like a tiny one here, 102, then the left hand side is your molecular ion. Okay, um, and then sometimes you get this, like if this, you get a tiny one at 100, for example, you have a tiny one at 101, and like they're about the same height. You don't ignore this because they are the same height. If they are the same height, this is your molecular ion. Okay, it's only, I emphasize again, that you get a tiny little one on the right, one unit to the right of a really significant peak on the furthest right on your max spectrum, then you ignore it. In other cases, you don't. Okay, so that's really, really important. Now, this spectrum is pretty boring because I already told you it's 116. Um, the only reason why I show you this is that because sometimes our spectrum doesn't actually show the whole thing. Um, which is really normal and if you get questions like that we'll say oh the molecular ion we'll say something like that the molecular ion um, is at 
is at 116, which is too weak to be observed, which is too weak to be observed. So that means the molar mass is 116 grams per mole, and then you can use the nitrogen rule from there. Okay, now I think this is the last one. Yes, it is. I do want to use this one to go through some isotope peaks. Okay, now this one is, ooh, is this obvious? Not that obvious, to be honest. Not the best graph to show you this, but we have other isotopes, which is CCL, oh, not CCL, which is just CL and BR. C CL, there are, there's chlorine 35, there's chlorine 37. If you actually notice on the periodic table, the chlorine, the molar mass for chlorine is 35.45 or something like that because the uh, majority of the chlorine is chlorine 35 and the minority is chlorine 37 and the mathematical ratio between the two is about one to three okay so three to one in this case but three to one so that means your chlorine 35 is going to be three times more than your chlorine 37 and how do you look for that? Like say, if this is a subsection, blah, 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 you know, random lines, then if you have one here, like say as 88 grams per mole, and then you want one here, which is 90 grams per mole, because remember the chlorine 37, this weighs two more grams per mole than your chlorine 35. So when you see it like this, so at 88, 90, this tells you, you got a chlorine isotope. Why? Because this peak on the left hand side, this one right here, is about three times the height as the one on the right hand side. Okay, so when so which one do we use as a molecular? We always use the left hand side one if you have identified the isotope. Okay, so this is M plus plus two due to chlorine, and you may go, where did that two come from? Well, because chlorine 37 weighs two more than chlorine 35. So the extra two is not because there are two more hydrogens, not because there are two more, could only be hydrogens, not because there are two more hydrogens, but because of there are two more neutrons in the chlorine. So we use this one, the 88, as our molar molecular ion. So the molar mass is going to be 88 grams per mole. Okay. Now, so hopefully you can see this. This is going to be a little bit tricky. So you can see that, that, can you guys see this roughly three to one toward the right hand side? Um, normally, and now this is where I actually want to talk about this, um, because chlorine weighs 35, 37, you can only look for this, uh, for the chlorines at 35 molar mass or higher. Right? So I'll give you one more example. Um, this video is going to, going to be quite long, but you know people tend to struggle with this um, spectrum. So let's get through this. Let's say if this is 35, 37, you're going to see one. You might see one like this. If this is like 88, 90, you might see one like this. And then you may see one like say 56. This graph is definitely not to scale. You may see one like this. You're going to see them multiple times on your spectrum because they you think about it if you're holding a pen if you grab a knife if you chop it in half like say if your chlorine is on one end there's so many different ways you can chop that pen that chlorine is going to show up multiple times as that particular fragment so this is how you know you have chlorine and in, if you got this graph as your final thing which one do you use for your molecular ion you look to the furthest right hand side and then you use this one okay we always we always ignore or ignore the isotope peaks. Okay, we always ignore the isotope peaks. All right, last one, which is a bromine. Bromine is a little bit easier. Bromine weighs 79, bromine weighs 81. The ratio between this is about one to one. So you are going to see, now they weigh 79 grams per mole, the bromines. So if you see a peak like this, if this is like 22 and 24, you're not gonna say, oh, there's a bromine here. Look, this is one to one. You know, my teacher told me, this guy on the internet told me, one to one ratio, that's bromine. That can't be bromine because it's too light. It has to weigh at least 79 grams per mole. So that means it's most likely going to understand like 110, 112, two units apart, then about one to one ratio. Then this is the molecular line, the one on the left hand side. Because this is due to the bromine isotope peak which weighs two more grams per mole. Okay, so we just ignore it. Okay, so hopefully this is quite helpful. I know it's quite long, um, but I will stamp um, the the video and I'll make a 
um, particular video just to go through some questions and um, just go to go through some variations here you might see okay so hopefully this has been helpful um, if you know anyone that needs more camp help send them my way and I'll see you guys next time bye bye